Thank you very much for coming along at a time when the campus is quite empty and getting ready for the semester. My name is Roland Weicker, and before I go on about the project, I'd like to introduce Professor Anne-Marie Carroll, who is our Associate Dean Research. She, she manages our faculty's uh, research office, which is one of the, the best institutions this university has. Like if you do a grant proposal or anything, the support we get from the research office is absolutely mind-boggling. It's just wonderful um, for the ASC, for other things. Uh, they do an incredible amount of work uh, behind the scene and with academics. So um, this is actually the opportunity I have to thank Emory for all the fantastic support. And she's kind of agreed to come along and say a few opening remarks before we get going on right. the round table. Thanks, Roland. Yeah, thank you. We have a fabulous team of uh, of uh, professional staff who work with us. So um, yes, acknowledgement to our team there as well, Rachel and Serena and Justin, they are wonderful. Um, look, it's lovely to be here. Um, in my role as ADR, I get to see a lot of fabulous research and I think that's one of the great benefits of sitting in a position that I am at the present time. I get to meet a lot of people and I get to read fabulous work that's being done. And um, I must say that the visual politics program has been are really delivering some fantastic work um, from the initiative. So I just wanted to touch base on how that initiative came about and some of the, I guess, highlights that um, we see from the Faculty Research Office that's been occurring with the Visual Politics Program. So um, as Roland said, I'm Associate Dean Research in the Haas Faculty and from time to time we're fortunate enough to be given a little bit of funding that we can give away to our staff so that they can advance research internally with a view to developing up um, really great external funding opportunities. And I know that opportunities like this where you can get a group of people together in one room for two days is, is really a springboard for a lot of that work. So it's wonderful to have you all here on campus at the University of Queensland to be able to put great minds together and to advance that work. So in 2015 and in 2017, we've run two internal schemes, and they've been rather large schemes of funding of about $100,000, uh, which is big in an internal scheme um, range. And the, um, the idea for those big schemes, our strategic funding schemes, was to really to bring researchers together um, from multiple disciplines to be able to answer questions that haven't been able to be answered before and that are, that are large challenges that not one discipline or one researcher can answer alone. And so we had uh, many applications come through, both in those rounds, and for each of them we were able to fund three very specific initiatives. And in 2015, the Visual Politics uh, Program really um, shot in terms of the kinds of questions that were being put forward and the kinds of um, research that could be done, I guess, collectively across a number of disciplines. So the aim of the visual politics program was to look at the exact, uh, the exact nature and impact of visual power. And I guess from somebody sitting outside the disciplines and sort of looking in, you know, we are, we are bombarded with visuals. We're bombarded on television, um, in social media, in the newspaper, um, you know, in, in photography, in so many areas with the visuals. But what impact does that have in terms of our decision making and our, and our politics? And, and that's the work that um, the team has been really expanding in a range of different projects. Uh, and this has been extremely successful because uh, what the team has been able to do is to bring over 50 researchers together one of the big highlights has been the mentoring that's been occurring with PhD students and with early career scholars to really advance the work. But the disciplines of political science, um, history, philosophy, communication, journalism, social sciences, psychology, information technology, uh, and electrical engineering, just to name a few, and I'm sure I haven't covered all of them, Roland, but they are certainly a number that um, you've been able to collectively bring together um, and also our libraries and our, our museums, our anthropology museum and our art, uh, our UQ art museum have also been engaged. Um, so many collaborators nationally and also internationally. Uh, so again, it's great that um, you're part of this research endeavour that has uh, been initiated. 
Uh, I think, and I just want to, um, before I pass back over to Roland, I just wanted to touch on some of the, the highlights that we see from the Faculty Research Office um, in terms of the impressive outcomes that has been built by this cross-faculty and, and university um, community in visual politics. So one of the areas that we see has been a real highlight is the virtual community and community and communication and outreach um, through development of a website, of a Facebook um, presence, Twitter account, blogs, opinion pieces, videos, commentary on um, visuality and contribution to the development of a MOOC on media and war. So that's a lot of communication and it's great to get that visibility, I think, and that's what we've been really um, impressed by. Uh, another thing that I think has been ongoing and it's just been released this morning has been the, uh, the second semester seminar program here on visual politics. But there's been a very active and really impressive seminar series program. And I think um, you would probably have a better account, but I think in what I looked at, you've, you've presented at least over 50 seminars across the time period uh, with the aim of building new links with people from across the different parts of the faculty and the university. And these have targeted um, forms such as having reading groups, um, being able to present on, on new projects to teams, having public lectures, um, public forums as um, today's is, round tables and workshops like those of the last couple of days. Um, and I know that many of you, I think, are going into a week of, uh, of conferencing as well. And I think what the Visual Politics Program has been very clever about too is to link to, to other conferences, to other events, and to be really informative in what's going on. And I know that you've also had some imagery as part of um, these conferences as well, which is to be applauded. Um, members of the team have attracted external funding, applied for external funding, and also attracted it um, both um, uh, from ARC and beyond. And all team members have been really productive uh, with high quality scholarly outputs. Um, an edited book on visual politics has come during this time period, as well as other books, journal articles, and other writing for public and academic audiences. Um, I mentioned the capacity building and mentoring that's been going on and I think that's fantastic and that's also come through a range of projects um, that have been developed during the time of the, of the visual politics program. Uh, things such as the politics of visuality, um, covering conflicts and disasters using the state of the art media lab, the living archives integrating archival collections with our libraries and art museums. Um, Australian Indigenous Art and Global Black Power to understand how arts act as visual politics networks. New methods for visual politics and how images shape responses to humanitarian crises. And in addition to these projects, um, there's also been new interdisciplinary collaborative projects and all of you sitting around the table here are one of, of those groups, which is the um, Visualising Korea project. Um, and that's been a very successful initiative and, and fantastic, again, that you've been able to have these two days to sort of write together, to come up with ideas together and to continue the great work that's been started in our, um, in our visual politics program. So um, I applaud uh, Roland for his great leadership in the work that he's been doing and the passion and commitment to the field of work. Um, and I also just wish you all this afternoon um, to have continuing wonderful dialogues um, together and, and hope that this um, flourishes as you continue to work together. So yeah, thank you very much for, for everything you've been doing and the wonderful work that will uh, continue to grow in this space and we look forward as a faculty to continuing to support um, to support you. So yeah, and, and it's lovely to be here. So thank you for listening and um, for having me here this afternoon, Roland, as well. And thanks. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for your most uh, generous and kind comments, but also for your support. And that, as you mentioned, you've got fantastic support from the faculty for both the overall visual politics program, which has seven pilot projects, and we have a variety of activities. But in particular, this project is one of the seven projects uh, uh, on visualizing Korea. And what we like to do today is we've spent, for those of you who come on board, we've spent the last two days at a workshop where we discussed uh, seven papers uh, in view of publishing them in a special issue of a journal, Asian Studies Review. 
So our whole, whole game was basically was to, to, to work on these papers, to polish them, to get them into a better state. And we have now the chance in this short session to present these papers. Uh, our idea is in part self-serving. You know, we want each of our authors to have the chance to crystallize what they do in a very, very short time period, maybe five minutes, but also to hopefully get informed you about what we're doing and to get some feedback about the kind of work that we do in the context of this project. So I'm gonna just say a few opening remarks um, about the project overall, its rationale, and introduce the speakers um, afterwards. So the, the project we've only basically, the main objective is to understand how visual representations shape critical moments in Korean history, society, and politics. And we understand visual that visuality very broadly, not just photographs and images. We have some papers, for instance, that deal with the color red uh, and its significance on the Korean Peninsula. We have papers that deal with monuments, with a range of visual artifacts and images. So the visual is a, it's a very broad concept. But we have sort of, and we, and we are very, and that's one of the strengths and challenges of our project, we are very interdisciplinary. We have people from linguistics, from cultural studies, from history, from education, from political science and international studies. So part of that workshop was to kind of talk across disciplines and you all know you come from different disciplines, the conventions in disciplines are, they vary, you know, a good paper in politics is not the same as a good paper in history. There's different conventions about how to structure an argument, how to develop concepts. So part of it, our task was to even that out and to find a common voice uh, across disciplines. So all of the papers that we'll be, you'll be hearing about in the very short glance address two things. Each paper looks at a key moment in Korean history. That might be colonialism, might be a war, it might be a massive protest, but they each look at one key moment. And they each examine how this moment shaped Korean history and how this moment in some sense influences politics on the Korean Peninsula still today. Uh, so that's the key thing you'll hear about different moments in Korean history from people from different disciplines. The second uh, objective that each paper has, and in some sense what ties them all together, is they all look at the visual in one way or another. Uh, so they looked at how either visuals shaped political events, uh, 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 whether it's through media representations, television, uh, uh, visuality of color, or how visuality helps us understand this event, you know, how the visual gives us political insights into so it's sort of these two elements that, that each paper looks at. And each presenter will take maybe five, seven minutes maximum, and my, my Swiss background, my obsession <laughs> with timekeeping will, uh, will have me be quite disciplined here, so that we want to have enough time for discussions at the end. We want to have people to come in, challenge us, ask questions, give us feedback. So we hope we can have um, uh, very short presentations. We'll, we will proceed in chronological order. It's always an issue when you arrange a special issue. How do you do it topically? So here we, we, we start chronologically. We start with Michael Kim, who is at the other panel. I'll, I'll introduce everyone briefly first. Maybe give me another two minutes. Uh, who is professor at Yonsei University, a professor of history, who is also dean of internationalization and, and is, I think, more in an airplane than, than at home, traveling around Asia and, and promoting Yonsei or Yonde. For, uh, for students. He'll start from a colonial perspective, uh, uh, looking at it as a historian. Then we have my UQ colleague, David Chapman, who follows up also with uh, a paper on colonization, looking at uh, a particular case study of a peace statue. Uh, that's a different, uh, Michael looks at photography, uh, Dave looks at, at statues. Then we have uh, Shine Choi, who is at the end of that chapter. She's a professor at Master University in New Zealand. Uh, is a very cosmopolitan person who has basically lived at half the globe from the UK to the US to Korea to the Philippines to many other places. And she's one of the few people who have written, uh, one of two people who has written uh, an authoritative book on visuals in Korea, on basically rethinking North Korea through visuals. It's an absolutely pathbreaking book. So we're pleased that she came over to join us. We're also pleased, of course, about Michael and, and Dave here as well. Then we have David Shin, who is over there. He is the other person that's written an authoritative book on, on, on Korea and visuals. I think there's only two books really that combine Korea and visuals in, in, in large book form in the context of politics. He's joined us from Kroningen University in the Netherlands, where he teaches international politics. 
He runs a course on visual global politics, so he has expertise in that realm as well. Uh, uh, Shine, by the way, will talk about monuments in the context of North Korea, North Korean monuments, uh, so on. And then David will talk about the process in, in, in Guangzhou and, and how cinematic representations influenced or shaped this, uh, this key event. I forgot before then, we have a new paper that Isaac Lee will present uh, with Min Chung Ji. Uh, they are both from UQ in linguistics and Korean studies. Uh, we have, don't have Min because I, yeah, Isaac thought he couldn't make it at first, but he had managed to make it and got the slides. So Isaac will, on behalf of Min Jung as well, talk about visual representations in North and South Korean school textbooks that reflect the Korean War. So how visual representations of school text textbooks look at the war. Uh, after that, yeah, David will talk about protests in Guangzhou. The last paper uh, I will do with, with uh, two colleagues, with uh, Moon Kyung Hee, who is here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who is from Changwon National University. She also has is a professor there in, in politics, has done fantastic work on women's studies and gender and, and identity uh, in the context of Korea. She also has a PhD from the ANU, so she has a, a, a big link mm -hmm. to Korea. And uh, Daniel Cho, who is over here, who is a deacon, uh, does fantastic work mm -hmm. on, on protests in Korea, on, on uh, North Korean human rights. He's one of the key experts we have in Australia on Korea and, and North Korean ethics and, and human rights. So we did a paper together. Uh, I will be presenting the paper, and then any kind of difficult questions I will pass on to the Moon team, to Kim and to, to Daniel. So, so we each take about five, six minutes to give you just a short glimpse of what we do, and then we'll open it up for questions. And I'll be sort of handling the slideshow from over here. represent uh, wartime Korea and the process by which the colonial government uh, acquired these images and uh, distributed them throughout uh, colonial Korea. Um, and so my, my paper points out that uh, in the history of photography, it was mostly foreigners and Japanese who captured a lot of images that we still have today. This is a picture from the uh, Sino-Japanese War, the leader of the Gongak movement, Eastern Learning uh, he was captured in, in, in film, right? But he's not the only one. Uh, many of the key moments in Korean history are captured by foreigners because the camera itself was rather expensive and, and complicated to operate. But then, uh, by the 1930s, we start to see the proliferation of amateur photography. And so the, the question of how to uh, you know, control these images, how to select them for publication becomes a, a key issue. And so within Japan, many of the uh, photography magazines and uh, many uh, publications have these contests where they, they sort of uh, define what is artistic photography, right? And it becomes a huge boom. Many Japanese uh, photographers submit their works. Well, a similar process happens in Korea, but it just happens that while there are like these uh, privately run uh, competitions, the colonial government happens to run the biggest one. So for 10 years, from 1934 to 1943, they ran the most authoritative uh, contest um, through the, uh, called the Keijo Nippo, which is, which is a Japanese language official newspaper. And so they got maybe a thousand submissions for many of these contests. And so it's what you see here, 1934 was the first exhibition. They would collect these photographs, uh, and the judges would be colonial officials, and then they would display them in these, the, sort of the most luxurious uh, department store, Mitsukoshi uh, uh, department store in, in, in Seoul. So it was a very like prestigious event. And um, these are some of the pictures that we see, 1935 exhibit. These are the winning uh, photograph uh, photographs. Uh, this is for 1936. Um, many of these photographs, again, are taken, actually taken by Japanese photographers, but there are a number of very uh, notable pioneer uh, Korean photographers who also submitted their works. But the winners are actually almost all Japanese. <laughs> but, no honorable mentions and displays were uh, by the works of Koreans. So starting with uh, 1937 though, as many of you guys know, the Japanese uh, launched the war with China. And so we start to see this contest being transformed into a way of capturing 
images of the war front or home front, uh, what's happening back in Korea. Uh, and so this is a, a picture that won the prize in 1938. It's what we call um, um, senden bari, which is thousand stitches. Uh, Japanese soldiers would wear uh, sort of a underwear <laughs> that's supposed to make it invincible to bullets with 1,000 versions, so <laughs> see stitches on it. And so it's a very uh, common process, and so it's captured in these films. And uh, 1940 winners, uh, what we see is uh, sort of the establishment of a kind of a format and certain techniques and subject matter that the Japanese colonial government wants to represent the colony as, right? So uh, these are very stylized images and they uh, reflect uh, certain themes and motifs that we're going to see over and over again. Now, just contextual, contextualize what I'm uh, doing here. I actually have like probably a thousand images from colonial Korea. And so it took me a while to figure out that they look remarkably similar and there's a kind of a obviously selection process. And so it turns out that these competitions was a way of collecting stock images, which the colonial government would then distribute to its publications. It also sent them to Japan. Uh, it was just a way that the Japanese uh, colonial officials could control the whole process of essentially digital asset management. Right? You see, you want to, any, anyone involved in publishing knows you need a lot of pictures to be able to uh, represent what you want. right? And so we see that this was a very systematic process, and it happened in a very broad context. And so, um, in a, maybe in a minute, I should sort of explain that. So we need to sort of engage the question of visuality and what these images mean. Um, they were distributed to these magazines uh, that were basically photo journals, uh, like you know, that's all they had pictures, uh, and they're very popular and quite um, widely distributed. And so we have these like images of, of everyday life. Uh, they're of uh, just people on the streets, uh, school children. One of my favorite, they're, all, they're, they're practicing how to bow. <laughs> and, uh, um, these images survive uh, uh, as a kind of a very valuable archive of everyday life and experiences. But behind it is a kind of a planning and, and, and control, right? Which I think it's very important to understand that in the realm of visuality, there's always politics and control behind which images are selected for publication, which are not. And so we need to be very careful with uh, what we assume is a representation of reality, because there's usually some kind of a controlling process. And within a colonial context, what does that mean? Well, the question of coloniality, what persists after life of colonies? Uh, I think we can see in these images uh, a kind of a, 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 a legacy of how, uh, from the very beginning of this technology called photography, there was this control process. And within the colony, we can often see sort of the very naked power that is behind the arrangement and control of what types of images are, are, are utilized, right? Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I guess I should, I think go more, but five, five minutes or so. <laughs> Okay, so my focus in history is um, the colonial period, as well as Michael's. Um, I'm particularly interested in the um, systematic sexually, sexual exploitation of Korean women during the Second World War um, and its connection to the contemporary context or political context in Korea. Um, particularly the 2015 agreement between Japan and South Korea. Um, the, the agreement itself has got a number of conditions in there. And there's two conditions I'm particularly interested in within the agreement. The first one is uh, the condition that both nations agree that the issue, the comfort women issue, or the euphemistic called comfort women issue, um, would be finally and irreversibly resolved as a result of the agreement. The second condition is that the South Korean government would campaign civil groups to address Japan's concerns over the Statue of Peace in front of the Japanese embassy. Um, this agreement has caused a lot of 
concern within South Korea itself, um, and particularly for the previous uh, government, but also for the government that's in power at the moment. Um, the original statue was placed in front of the Japanese embassy to celebrate the thousandth anniversary of the Wednesday demonstrations. The Wednesday demonstrations, as they're named, occurred every Wednesday of every week uh, since the, uh, the mid-2000s. Mid um, the 2015 agreement has led to the statue becoming the centre of protest. Um, and it's particularly directed against the intent of the, agree the agreement in declaring the comfort women issue as being over, and also threats to the statue of peace itself. Um, the protests have all also been directed at uh, President Park Kun Hee, uh, signed, who signed the agreement in 2015. Um, although the, the statue is called the Statue of Peace, of course, it's caused a lot of um, tension and also conflict in South Korea as well, directed towards Japan. Here's a photo of the, the statue itself. As you can see, it's, it's fixed in position. It's strategically located in front of the Japanese embassy where in some ways it reflects the colonial gaze back at an institute of a formal, uh, formal colonising nation. Um, and what I'm looking at here in the visual is the fact that the 2015 agreement, I think, has become a catalyst that's triggered a, a sort of metamorphosis in which the visual presence of the statue has been significantly, significantly expanded by its release from this physical boundless as a single effigy in front of the embassy of Japan. I'll show you what I mean by that. First of all, soon after the signing of the agreement in 2015, a replica statue was uh, constructed and placed in front of the Japanese consulate in Busan. Um, this ended up with the uh, ambassador for Japan, and also the consulate general for Japan, being recalled back to Japan for a period of time as well. And this boosted the visual impact of the statue. Um, it attracted a lot of media interest and images were quickly distributed through news outlets and social media outlets over the internet globally. Further to that, there was another replica statue created and mobilised, literally mobilised, um, by being placed on buses by the Dome Transit Bus Company. And these replicas were able to travel around with the public and become more entrenched in the public realm for everybody to, to see. Another quite striking um, situation was this one where uh, many miniature replication, uh, miniature statues were, were constructed and replicated. Uh, these are actually representing the, the, the past survivors, uh, past couple women survivors, with their names and their um, dates of birth and death attached to them. Um, not only is this striking in situ, it's also striking when it's sent out and digitally uh, like it is here. And this was also distributed quite widely. Um, so going outside of South Korea across borders, it also became a transnational phenomenon. Um, with very close to home, a statue being constructed in Sydney. Um, this is very interesting because the local Japanese community um, argued against the placement of the statue. And they used the, um, the Section 18C of the Australian Racial Discrimination Act as leverage to try and get rid of the statue. Um, they weren't successful. It was actually moved to a church um, where the pastor at the church agreed to have it on, on the church property. Um, not only in Australia, but also in California, Glendale, California, where there were also protests by local Japanese communities. And it, was, it went all the way to the US District Court, where it was overturned in favor of the statue. So the statue remains where it is. So through these images and through the, the 2015 agreement, my argument is that the original intent of the statue has been disrupted by the 2015 agreement. And as a result, the power, impact, and influence of the statue has been vastly amplified through a visual expansion of its presence both within South Korea and outside, where it's been transformed from a single object in one, fixed in one location through multiple manifestations in many locations through an array of media. Isaac, uh, Isaac is 
filling the paper together with Min Jung Ji. And Min Jung, she sends her apologies. She had to leave the, the workshop a bit earlier. So Isaac will uh, present on behalf of both of them. We also have one additional paper on the color red. Uh, a scholar was Skyped in, and she sends her apologies as well. She, she's in Seoul. And, I analyzed uh, North and South Korean language textbooks, how they depict Korean War. So, when I look at that, I will show you the visual images. Uh, textbooks, uh, they stress that they uh, shut down USA B-29, is it like a famous for really the crowd of America, which is like bombers. Yeah? But they shut down, with a normal air fighter, they shut down uh, B-29s. And also North Korean textbook, they stress that Korean govern governors building at the time, we call Chung Chang. But North Korea thinks that we occupy the Seoul in three days, including government build building. And still, like this kind of anti Americanism, still, they teach, when I look at their current textbooks published uh, 2002 and 2010, they still use this image to uh, promote uh, anti Americanism. This is actually in school uh, sports day, but they promote anti-Americanism in, in, in the textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, left one, North Korean soldiers actually uh, destroying US tank uh, with a hand grenade. Look at the image, uh, soldier is uh, much bigger than like uh, tank size. Yeah? Also tank uh, was uh, like a uh, depicted, uh, is they didn't describe tank properly. The, the bottom tank actually don't have the cannon, yeah? So uh, they, that way uh, they stress uh, how they defeated Americans. And then uh, South Korean textbooks, uh, they stress uh, North Korea uh, invade South Korea with tanks. At that time, we, South Korean didn't have any tank, yeah? But look at the uh, South Korean textbook, they stress uh, running toward the tank. And they threw a hand grenade and destroyed the tank. So South Korean textbook, they stress that even though they had tank, we had the uh, never give up fighting spirit, and we did our best. Yeah? So th this actually stress uh, uh, South Korean uh, nationalism. This is a South Korean textbook. Actually, this is a photo image. The Incheon uh, landing process. Megasa, American general, actually, he conducted the uh, Incheon oper landing operation. It was very successful, so they described this. Uh, and also here, bottom picture, they talks about, they depict the uh, UN. This is a UN flag. Maybe not many of you know this UN flag. Korea, South Korea, we used to have UN Day, actually, public holiday, when I was in mm -hmm. private school. So, they stress that uh, UN uh, actually rescued Korea, not USA. 
This is a UN air fighters destroying North Korean tanks. This is South Korean textbook. They still Capitol building, but they uh, retook Capitol building, but they stress a South Korean flag here. Just a little part of the Capitol building here. So, so this way, uh, North Korean textbook they depict a Korean war or the, like a liberating South Korea from the oppression of USA. And also the Korean president, Lee Sung-man. But they failed to uh, portray the US role in the Korean War, as well as they didn't actually include any visual image of Chinese PRC soldiers. With PRC, they sent around the one million soldiers. They defended North Korea, but they didn't include anything there. By portraying the uh, North Korean hero who uh, hoisted the DPRK flag in the Capitol building, also destroying US tank with a hand grenade, and destroying the B-29 bombers or warships with the few weapons. They stress uh, like uh, anti-Americanism. And also, uh, they uh, still like this anti-Americanism is present in North Korea. When you look at the uh, news newspaper, Kim Jong-un, he said, I, will, I can press a button to, to like, uh, send a missile, nuclear missile to America. Even though they have maybe 10 nuclear weapons, we don't know how many, but we're much smaller than most USA. But still, they think oh, we can win. They, they still like this kind of uh, attitude that's present in North Korea. South Korean uh, textbooks, they stress North Korea as an invader. And they are cruel and merciless and murderous, oppressive, or destructive. So citizens in Seoul, Seoul under DPRK occupation, they suffered. They were waiting for ROK soldiers' uh, liberation. South Korea also, uh, they talks about the role of UN rather than USA. Because USA, actually, they sent the, the, around 90% of the soldiers actually from US, US soldiers. But they didn't uh, describe the role of US rather than they emphasize UN's role. Because in order to demonize uh, uh, North Korea as a rogue nation, rogue or that, that's why they d describe the UN as international police. So North Korea, they didn't uh, apply the commander from US UN. That's why they, it's not a legitimate government. So they depicted the UN, UN's role rather than US role. So thank you. Thank you very much. Shine Choi, next up. So should I use the mouse as well? I think it's just this way, so. Okay, um, so I am looking at uh, monuments um, in, um, in North Korea. And in particular, I focus on um, the Mansude Grand uh, Monument um, as it is shown in the picture here. And so this site was constructed in 1972 in commemoration of um, Kim Il-sung, the founding father of North Korea's uh, 60th birthday. Um, and so it is not surprising right, that uh, this site um, features, a very, uh, features uh, the bronze statue of Kim Il-sung. Um, and it has then since become of the focal point, or in many ways a morbid fascination by outside visitors to um, to uh, visit the site. Right? So it's not surprising that this picture uh, taken by Philip Chancellor exists. Um, it's a very common picture that has been taken before him as well as after him. But it's also not surprising that, again, um, the North Korean citizens are comfortable uh, be being taken, right? This picture uh, being taken as in this photograph. Um, as people who have this reverential relationship with Kim Il-sung, right? So it, it's not seen as a site of authoritarian repression, right? We as outsiders sense that there is something wrong, but we read it as an icon or an image that tells us that there's something fundamentally wrong with North Korea uh, because of its of the terrible human rights uh, record, um, terrible politics, its terrible international security, fill up as a terrible international security Dilemma. But at the same time, um, what I'm trying to do in this paper is how do we go beyond uh, this sort of commonsensical understanding of North Korea as an authoritarian state? Why, 
corner are more open ways in which we can engage with North Korea and the, the problem of state violence uh, that also recognizes that the North Korean state and its authoritarianism or Juche uh, principle, which is the foundation of its authoritarianism, um, is that idea of self-reliance, um, is also a product of and a problem of um, violence of international hierarchy. Right? So how do we deal with the problem of state violence and the problem of the violence of international hierarchy together to open up exactly what exa uh, what kind of engagement do we need to do in this field? And so, and what what do the monuments, right? What does the monumental politics allow us to do, to do that? So what I argue in the paper is that we need to go beyond the focus on what feels most comfortably as, as, um, as, as where the emphasis should be, both from the North Korean state's perspective as well as the outside perspective, which always focuses on, um, on this bronze statue, statue. So we need to go beyond and look at this monumental site more broadly, and on also not just the monumental site that has these two statues um, lining the two, uh, the, the, the bronze statues, so the, the statues that symbolize the revolutionary history of North Korea. So on one side, it's, just, it's, it's supposed to chronologically and historically tell a narrative of North Korea's, uh, the history of Korea under Japanese um, imperialism, and the other, understanding the current North Korean state as continuing that anti-imperial um, uh, war, right? state building as a, main, a, a, a way of understanding state building as, as a, a mode of being at war with the world. So it's not just anti-imperialism, anti-imperialism married to uh, uh, um, anti-Americanism, and this is actually an international, right? an international uh, a fight against the international force that is the imperial force. Um, and Chute, as uh, aesthetic and as a politist, is, is North Korea's answer to that. And that orders the, inter the, the North Korean society. But the argument I want to make is that actually it also is a way to make claim to the international as a space of politics. And Chute um, principles, when I read it through the monumental uh, uh, site allows us to do that. So for us to enter that level or and way of thinking about authoritarianism and its link to anti-imperialism, we have to have understanding of uh, what these, the, the history of, of the revolution, the revolutionary state. Um, but for me, when we do that, when we take history, the historical approach, the problem is that then we, our vision aligns with the North Korean state, right? So how do we go beyond that? Uh, for me, what has been interesting is to go beyond actually the monumental site, um, but actually do the readings um, of North Korean sources, right? Um, North Korean sources that have um, conceptualized, right, how this ideological monumental art is supposed to work. And so Odeon um, is a sculptor. He was part of the team that constructed this monumental site, Mansude, and uh, he has written this book with another uh, North Korean art critic. And what I find interesting in reading their work is that actually their emphasis on monumental art is on history, yes, but also on questions of method and form. Right? So um, we assume that North Korean propaganda just works by coercion, Right? or censorship, but also works through theory and concept. And I think that's important to draw out as well. And what I do then is that, okay, um, I am developing this way of rereading, reading the monumental site uh, in a way that is against the grain of how monumental site is supposed to work, right? so create this unity. Um, and how do I then use this method um, to study visuality to actually then understand the textual politics um, of, of North Korea, which is important. The 1970s is significant because it's a point wherein the Juche philosophy emerged and it, it became a concrete form and the monumental politics proliferated. 
and um, authoritarianism as, as we understand it emerge, but also it's a period of um, North Korea's active diplomatic engagement with the third world and its, its entry into the non-aligned movement in 1956 where this book, uh, 1950, 1975, and this book published in 1976, which is a collection of Kim Il-sung's uh, speeches and ideas about non-aligned movement, is also commemorating that, that peak, right? That sort of a claim that he's making about the world. And what I do then is to use the monumental method to reread the text. And so what I find is the, the imagery, like the idea of lines and circles, right, are the way in which the ideas about Chute become a concrete form. So ideas have to gain a particular shape and form. Ideas and text don't simply work as text, they always work as images. And so that's sort of what I'm doing. I was also going to say, um, David. Oh, yeah, yes. I was also going to say we obviously we tried to as a project we tried to have a balance between we wanted to cover 150 years of Korean history, which is impossible to cover, but we tried to have slices of different periods: the colonial period, the war, you know, North Korea, now the South Korea, to get a bit of a balanced view of various aspects of uh, of the last 150 years of Korea, which is impossible to. Oh, that's not Yes, um, I want to write about this film, A Taxi Driver, and maybe some of the audience have seen this film. Um, is it? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, yes, and, um, and th th yeah, um, that was a very popular film in South Korea. I think, I think that, that's the most popular film about the uh, Gwangju uprising itself. The Gwangju uprising is, uh, I think, one of the most important turning points in South Korean uh, history and uh, collective memory because it is somehow the beginning of the transition from authoritarian rule to democratic governance. You know, this is why, um, yeah, I, this is a key moment f um, uh, for me and, and for others, uh, obviously, and also why I'm trying to answer the question or address the question of, you know, how is the notion of the new, new Korea uh, articulated or portrayed uh, in that film? Film. The reason why I have um, I picked that film uh, over others because there are also other uh, popular films about uh, the Gwangju uprising is um, you know it's the most uh, most successful uh, also critically acclaimed but also it was uh, endorsed personally by uh, the president South Korean president uh, uh, Moon Jae-in who said um, that yeah this film um, is telling the truth about what happened uh, in Gwangju and. I find it uh, interesting because also it helps me then to connect um, or anchor my paper in the literature on popular culture and world politics, um, where one of the key arguments of this kind of scholarship is that you know popular cultural artifacts like film, or, or music, or comics, they um, shape people's understanding or knowledge of real world uh, events. Another reason why I picked that film or what makes this film interesting is um, yeah, this this concept of uh, reflexivity or self-reflexivity uh, which comes from film studies and I think in that film it's it's a, a, a lighter version of uh, reflexivity so the film is a film about filming uh, where um, the film is, uh, addresses itself as a medium of expression and um, I think the central articulate or the central idea that the film is articulating is that visual imagery uh, so in the form of news footage was constitutive of the contentious politics of Guangzhou, or also, also of the global politics uh, of Guangzhou. In my uh, paper, I wanna, I'm, I'm trying to um, address well, three, I'm raising three points that you can see here, you know, system versus cit citizens, um, struggle between inside and outside, and the role of women. So um, the, the first point um, relates to somehow the presence and absence of particular markers uh, in that film. One is, for instance, um, you know, that the Korean flag, which I think is a particular marker of national identity, is shown in the context of protests or protesters, you know, uh, when, when it's about their concerns and not when, you know, violence is committed by um, official institutions like the military or the police. So I think, you know, you have the, the new Korea is being articulated 
um, with the protesters because of that. And also, you know, mm -hmm. um, you see that um, when violence is committed by uh, the military, that the, the faces are hidden. So there's a, um, a disembodiment or the, the defacing of uh, the uh, the system, which helps ac actually then to um, to um, articulate the struggle um, in Guangzhou in terms of you know a military apparatus versus uh, citizens. I think the second point um, that I that I want to make is. Um, I think the film articulates um, the Guangzhou uprising in terms of the struggle between inside and outside. And here, I mean, also judging from, I mean, from the comments that I got previously today, um, the, the struggle between inside and outside is on different levels. Um, because on, on the first hand, I thought, um, you know, the, the inside here is the Korean track, the Korean taxi driver, right? And the outside is the the, the foreign journalist. Um, oh, sorry, I think I, I forgot to mention that the film is about a taxi driver who gets involved in the journalist reporting about the Guangzhou uh, uprising, uh, actually. And, um, but the, the taxi driver is also an outsider in a sense because he's from Seoul and he drives to Guangzhou, he has no clue what's going on, whereas the journalist knows what is going on, even though he's from the outside, from, um, uh, you know, from a foreign country, from Germany, actually. And, um, but the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning it is because um, this um, corresponds to, uh, I think, a very popular co a Korean narrative, or a genuine Korean narrative, uh, which is about um, you know, the reliance on outside forces when it comes to Korean domestic affairs, and that the Koreans are somehow dependent on uh, outsiders uh, when they want to yeah, determine their own thing. And the last point um, that I'm mentioning uh, in that film, like when you think of, you know, um, how does the new Korea look like? And the new Korea, I mean, for, in the new Korea, there's no place for active women, <laughs> in a sense, because the film um, at least portrays women in more traditional role, the traditional roles, um, like for instance, as, as mourners or as providers uh, of food, and not more in, 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 in active roles uh, as, as protesters or even as leaders. Uh, yeah. I think I'll leave it here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we had one additional paper on the color red, how, how the color red in Korean history was always associated with communism, but how the World Cup, uh, uh, the football World Cup in Korea, changed that and, and, and led to kind of a, a reinterpretation of the color red as a critical, pretty significant element. So this is the first we Skyped in, so this won't be presented here. So we'll be presenting the last paper, hopefully in five minutes, and then we have enough time for discussion. It's a paper in collaboration with Moon kyung -hee here and Daniel Chubb and I present the paper only because the paper revolves around photographs I took myself 30 years ago of a key event in Korean history but all the questions I think will be handled by, by Daniel and, and, and Kyungi who know a lot more about the substance of the issues at stake so I just want to tell the story about the photographs it's, we look at um, mass protests in 1987 in June 1987 it's part of the same in some sense topic that that um, that David looked at is the transition from authoritarianism to democracy. Uh, Korea in the 80s was a military dictatorship on the front of one, uh, very ruthless, you know, you couldn't protest. And in, in June 81, massive protests erupted uh, to the point where the president had to resign. They, they were huge, they were nationwide, and I was sort of part of the protest, I took photographs. And, and so what we look at is that that moment in, in Korean history, the protest in 287 against John Duong, uh, threatening very great as people power, it led to the recognition of the president. And oddly afterwards, uh, uh, there was a massive election campaign where I took photographs as well. And at the end, the, the two kind of progressive candidates, uh, uh, Kim Dae Jung and Kim Yong Sung, divided the vote, and basically the government uh, 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 selected the candidate, the general. Uh, uh, won the election. So, so it's about the, the transition of democracy and the limits to it, and we look particularly at the role that images play. We initially wanted to do a uh, visual autoethnography, 
where we talk about the experience of witnessing the event, I, through participating, taking photographs and so on, Chongqi uh, growing up in Busan, witnessing the event, and Daniel coming in as, as an expert on, on protests. But then we thought this is going to be way too complicated for a short paper. So we just do a more conventional paper using my photographs of the events uh, to tell a story and look at how photographs play themselves a key role of the event because they circulated knowledge of the event, but also how photographs are part of how we remember the event today. So I'll walk you briefly through the stage of the, the protests and then we can talk about the significance in sort of maybe discussion. This is a process at Yonsei University where Michael is teaching today, where protests started to take place in sort of April, May, June between students throwing Molotov cocktails and, and the police basically uh, uh, opposing them. Very ritualized sort of forms of protest. Uh, the interesting thing there is that at some stage the protest spread from uh, the campus to across the city. Uh, this is in the center of Seoul, uh, where they became bigger and bigger. It wasn't just like 100 people, it was 300, 500, it was thousands. And at some point it was literally like hundreds of thousands of people protesting across the country. So we look at the visual evidence of how also middle class people got involved. It wasn't just students anymore, it was like the population at large getting involved in the protest, being dissatisfied with the regime. So we look at that escalation of conflict. Um, we look at, at, um, at the strategic sort of elements of it, of how a largely nonviolent group of protesters managed to basically dismantle an authoritarian regime that was armed to the teeth. So how can sort of people without kind of any kind of military possessions basically uh, force the regime change? We also look at the absence of women in the visualization of protest. They played a key role, but most photographs focus on the heroic actions, like you know, throwing Molotov cocktails and stuff like that, but women actually played a key role. And that's the, the limits of visualization, so to speak. It focuses on particular aspects of the protests. And then we look at the election campaign that followed. So I went to pretty much every election, every candidate looked at their campaigns. Some were absolutely massive. This was an election campaign by, by Kim De Jong, there was about a close to a million people gathering in the space and they kind of they were you could see it they climbed up on trees buildings it was just this massive sort of gathering of also emotional outpouring and that probably a, as a result of this I've done work on protest but also I've done work on emotions with with Emma Hodges and, and, and this kind of event is, is entirely emotional it's like that the number of people uh, on the square protesting and demanding change was quite dramatic um, I got a bit of shit yesterday in my presentation. <laughs> so, uh, I showed Kim the drone, but he didn't have a face. <laughs> so, so just to show that I did manage to get some pictures of Kim the drone, who lost the election, but subsequently, a decade later, became president for, for 10 years in Korea. So what we sort of look at, basically, is, is how do we use these photographs as a form of insight into the event? And we want to do two things, look at the photographs as or visual representation does they play a key role because back then you know, there was television photographs, the event circulated, so people knew about the events partly because they, they, they participated, but also because they saw it on television, in the newspaper, internationally. And you want to see how these photographs are a form of a memory of these events and how they shaped current politics. There were massive protests uh, more recently against uh, the president that sort of harked back to the 87 protests. And Kyunghee and, and Danya will elaborate on these issues a bit more in, in the question and answer um, period. Um, but that's sort of, in some sense, that's the, these are the papers we have. There's this one on, on color red as the final one, but that's sort of the papers we have. We're trying to shape into a coherent special issue. That's what we've been working on over the last two days. So we would really, and it's not, been easy to come, we come from very different backgrounds, as you probably saw, from history to linguistics to, to politics, education, it's, and getting that into a coherent sort of whole is, is not an easy process. But we appreciate the feedback from you. I suggest we let first people speak before we, the authors come back so that we have a bit of time for everyone to, to have a say. And at the end, maybe each, each of our authors can sort of offer a short response to the issues that were presented. So any kind of comment, feedback, critique, um, ideas would be very welcome. Questions and clarifications. Mm -hmm. Is there any Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, interesting presentations. And uh, my questions is related to uh, 
questions of uh, coloniality. I think uh, some presentations has provided at least two accounts of, on how uh, colonialism uh, affects uh, the Korean history. The first is Japanese colonialism, and then the, the second will be the, the American colonialism, or or we could say imperialism uh, after the, 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 the colonial era. Uh, my question is, how could we understand uh, coloniality in a sense? And uh, I think they represent also the, the two uh, different uh, contexts of colonialism. The first is the Western colonialism, and the first is Asian colonialism, and how they, they bring us insights about uh, the coloniality of politics from, from the Korean perspective. Very insightful um, series of papers. I think I've got a question about um, statues. Uh, so, Dave. Um, so, maybe uh, I don't know if, if you talk about this at all in the paper, but I wonder whether there is something that needs to be said about statues that goes beyond the visual. Because statues are not just big, like it's not. There is more to statues mm -hmm. than, than just the visuality, right? So they are mm -hmm. quite embodied, mm -hmm. material uh, things, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, I'm just wondering whether that needs to be, like, whether there is something that might help you or that might hurt something, or... Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got a question for David. Um, I just, I was wondering, I'm, I'm quite supportive uh, to the use of popular culture to elucidate certain certain issues and but I think I wanna push you or maybe you do it already, but you know, just out of curiosity. I think it's quite important that we also um, I mean the, the question that I've got is can, can you actually say the things that you the three points that you wanna say without using the film? And what is the film? I mean is it is it does it become the, the use of popular culture, does it become just a, a way of, you know, adding something that makes us researcher, researchers do something different, something more pleasurable than, you know, textual research? So I think I'm, you know, I'm just wondering whether you could say these points without using using the film that you want to use. And the reason is not, not that I want to suggest that you shouldn't use the film, but I'd like to push you to, to clarify why we should use Culture. Uh, thank you. It was really a very convincing, and, and we got really all encompassing ideas about the Korea through visual um, visuals. Actually, I'm I have a couple of questions, but I will be very short. And first, uh, I'll first go to the about the movie. David Shim. Actually, I watched this movie and it was kind of very um, convincing and it really portrayed the whole issues regarding Korean revolutions as a modern evolution of modern Korea. And um, but um, I would ask ask you the question especially about the role of um, um, the, the, the if I'm not wrong, it, it was a very small um, protest at the beginning, but later it um, like spread. Um, uh, from students to the um, uh, general public, the, so being a protest, and what were the trigger points that all in all works of lives um, from different cultures, background people contributed to the protest? Uh, like, what are the main trigger points that I, I, I'm trying to cast the sentiment of the people? Like, who? What was the sentiment that? It, but because there are a couple of um, steps, um, initiatives before also regarding doing protests, but it didn't become successful. But this one it was very one. And also regarding the women, there are as you mentioned that the role of women was kind of Eastern tradition. But in, even in the film, the role um, like um, the girl, uh, in, in, when the uh, like people are injured and taken to the hospital. The role of the nurses, and they, it was kind of bold enough, and 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 there was an old lady who also like um, kind of inspired 
the other protesters and the journals itself. That's, and I think that was kind of convincing from the, the role of the women. The, the, it was the path breaking moment for the Korea itself, showing up that how women being silent but still taking part act actively. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, it's an, and my last question uh, to Michael, yeah, <coughs> again, and then I was looking at the pictures and the pictures looks really um, general, like as you mentioned also, like, like general life, so like people, how did you, like maybe in your paper you, you have elaborated, how did you find the connections of authoritative design in this all brands of general <coughs> representations. Thank you. Any other comments? Anyone would like to come in? Yeah, to so Michael, uh, I saw two photos uh, showing cleaning mm -hmm. and sweeping. Yeah? That image, when I and my student have to look at, put into Japanese language textbooks, uh, they, uh, which was published for Korean uh, students. Uh, they had a, like, uh, the, the contents of a cleaning, road, or hygienic issue, so not for Japanese students. Just I'm wondering whether have you found any uh, images uh, like published in Japan for this kind of Japanese citizen? Do they have that kind of image as well? Yeah. So maybe we can have a round of responses from, from each of the authors very briefly, and then maybe at the end, Daniel and Kyunghee can elaborate a bit <coughs> on, on especially the question of authoritarianism because they haven't had a chance to come in. So maybe if each of the authors can take just two minutes, three minutes to respond, and maybe starting with Michael, since we go chronologically again. Um, question about the speaking. Uh, the colonial government made books textbooks for Koreans, but in general, Japanese use the textbooks from Japan. So, you know, I think it just happens to be the emphasizes for the Koreans. Uh, I'm sure they do exist in Japanese just regular textbooks, but they, they localize the Korean textbooks, and so there you see like what is the Japanese want to emphasize among the Korean population, and so yeah, sleeping is orderness and cleanliness is something that they often emphasize. And the question about the everyday life, um, yeah, well, so in my paper, I actually point out that Japanese prefer certain types of pictures uh, of certain types of activity, shrines, bridges, hygienic kind of things. And so even though the images look very ordinary, uh, behind that is a kind of a classification process where these are the types of images that the government wants. Right? Because again, this is a question about coloniality too. How do you represent a colony? Like how do you, uh, what does that mean to be colonial? Well, in, in many uh, scholars of question, actually, in, do you need to, de to, to like, define something as colonial? Isn't modernity colonial as a, you know, there, what's the difference? Actually, you used to have 1% controlling most of the societies. <laughs> There's no need to call it colonial when it's global coloniality. Modernity is colonial, but there is something colonial about colonialism, and that's a uh, difference. We mark difference in colonialism. But in the photographs, there's a, there's a, there's a concentrated effort to mark Koreans as others. And this, they also need to realize that this is a period of assimilation. Japanese are trying to assimilate Koreans into Japanese. At the same time, they're saying, you're still Korean. But what does that mean to, to differentiate? But that has to do with power relations. They don't want to include all the Koreans into the power elite. Uh, they try to differentiate. But then this then, after 45, survives as a way of national identities and differing cultures. But even within post-45 uh, Korea, Park jong the president of Park, emphasizes the Shina uh, legacy and the Taegu and the <laughs> south, uh, eastern part over the west. Uh, that's an internal colonialism. It's saying that these are the real legacy of the Koreans and leaves out entire areas of Korea. You know, so, yeah, the question of coloniality, there's a, it's all about kind of managing difference and hierarchies and power, which these photographs are intended to help reaffirm and, and create. Okay. Um, okay, just about statues. Um, in the presentation, I focus mainly on visual because that's what we're talking about. But in the paper, 
um, I address a number of issues and with the Comfort Women statues, one of the main areas of concern is memory. If you link that to a 2015 agreement, in the agreement the aim is to actually provide an end or closure, finality to that whole process of dealing with the Comfort Women issue. But um, the whole purpose of erecting a statue in front of the Japanese Embassy is to actually have memory, have rem remembrance, re recollection of that, and to give some sort of permanence. So a statue is really an, an embodied piece. It's a 3D artifact, so it's, it gives a presence, a permanence, and therefore is connect uh, connected to memory, where everything is trying to, to get rid of that memory or to try and present closure to that. The statue is actually fighting against that. So I think that's perhaps what you're, you're alluding to, the fact that um, it's not a, just a two-dimensional image a three-dimensional artifact that can be reproduced either digitally or as a solid object as well. So I hope I've answered your question. Isaac, did you want any comment? No. Oh, what, what? Did you want to comment at all on <laughs> anything? Well, that's fine, you don't need to. Just oh. want to give you the chance to. No, no. I have a question to David. Uh, the term comfort women actually is not the right term for Korean perspective. We think it's sex slave. The Japanese term they made like comfort women. Comfort doesn't have a negative meaning. So the term the strange for Koreans, uh, Korean scholars to use. Uh, another issue is uh, when the, they made uh, like a uh, joint uh, declaration of uh, Japanese foreign minister, South Korean foreign minister. And they said South Korean foreign minister promised uh, we will campaign uh, civil groups. But when I read the Korean word, it doesn't mean like campaign, something like that. So I think two state, two countries, uh, they made a different statement, different interpretations. Mm -hmm. so, so I wonder whether you have a chance to look at it or not. Yeah, I looked at, well, I don't read Korean, so I looked at, I actually translated the Korean using Google Translate. Which was we made with uh, this. Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's always yeah. putting quotation yeah. marks, right? It's a direct trans. It's an English direct translation from the Japanese term "yonfu." Yeah. Um, so, um, scholars do use it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's used quite commonly in English. Academic, but I think, I, know, but I think there's a lot of there's a lot of there's there's, there's a tendency also for people involved in um, talking about gender studies as well to use. Um, sexual slavery or sexual exploitation of Korean women during the Second World War. And, so, and it was a systemized approach that the Japanese military introduced. Uh, it's not just Korea as well, right? it expands to many other countries. So I can understand where you're coming from. Um, and I've used that term a couple of times here, but in the paper I've used you know, the sexual exploitation of, of, of women, which is, probably explains it in much more in what you're saying, the terms you're saying in a much more sort of concrete way. But I understand exactly what you're saying about the company. And it's usually in quotation marks as well. Shane, did you want to comment? Um, just I mean, that's actually a really good, interesting, really useful question. I don't have an answer to that. But I think from the North Korean perspective, you know, and I, this is true for the Pacific as well, um, you know, Japanese colonialism created a context wherein American imperialism can proliferate globally and in, in Asia, Asia Pacific. So I think the Korean case is interesting because, well, the North Korean case is really interesting because that critical picture has a way of creating a really violent society. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to kind of think about, well, what do we do about this anti imperial sort of legacy in Asia? And how do we do it in a way that is um, that attends to the violence of anti-imperialism as well as imperialism, um, and and so that's you know one point I think that uh, is worth thinking about. The other thing about commemoration and statues uh, that I just wanted to add to the conversation is that I wonder whether statues and commemorative monuments are less about memory and remembering even though that is sort of the ideological, that is, that is what the artist sculptures and the states and people who pay for these things say that they are. But I think what's interesting about Dave's paper and 
the way in which I'm thinking about monuments that is that, that actually it seems to be less about the past or the present or about time and plurality, but there might there seems to be something else that we need to sort of attend to. And I'm not really sure what that is, but I, I just think the way in which memory literature and remembering has sort of have become hegemonic way of understanding mm -hmm. statues might be quite problematic. And I'm just wondering what else we can look at. Can I just add a bit? Yeah, I think that it really ties on, on you know, what you we were trying to say. So I think that what I was trying to get with the comment about embodiment and the fact that statues are material is just what Shine was saying, mm. saying right now, right? So it's not about the temporality, but it's actually about matter. Like it, it's the material presence. So for instance, even in, here in Australia, one of the problems with monuments is the fact that they are on indigenous land, right? Mm. So it's not necessarily that they are occupying, like that they are, it, it is also about what they are commemorating for sure, but it's also the fact that they are on stolen land. So it's, it's, it's the use of matter to colonize. So it's the use of the actual physical material stuff. It's called colonizing the land. And then there is a memory, there is a temporality that is inscribed into that. But part of the problem is the fact that it's, you know, something on stolen land. Mm. And then I, like, I think that there is some sort of materiality there that mm. for you, I don't know if you, if you you know, if that can help you at all in, in the thinking process or... Well, I understand what you're saying about it occupying, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a symbol of colonization occupying a space on indigenous land, that's what you're saying. In the case of the, the, the statues that I'm talking about in Korea, they're actually on Korean land, but they're facing a colonizer. So it's, a, it's, a, it's confronting the, the past in that way. And I understand what you were saying too, Shine. It's, um, there is a problem with generalizing and saying that statues are there to, to memorialize or to remember. They're also political tools in many ways as well. Um, they can be used in different ways. But I think the, the, the original intent in these statues is for, for some link to the past and bringing that into the present. It's not really about going back to the past, but it's about bringing that past into the present and making it um, have some, take up some space in the present. But it's probably, it's worth thinking about it more deeply, I think, for sure. David, did you want to? Yes, maybe I can also pick up on what Shine has said um, um, with Federica. Um, because I'm also actually, for another project, writing a, a very similar paper also on the Statue of Peace. And where I'm trying, in, in, I mean, in contrast to um, Dave, I'm trying to do a material ethnography of that statue. So, you know, what does the statue actually, not what does it mean uh, you know, to uh, the visitor uh, there? How does it engage the audience? And, and I think maybe this is also then uh, a, a reply to um, your question of, you know, we, um, in terms of, it's, it's not necessarily about time, where I, where, whereas I think it is also, uh, monuments are also about time, or especially that's that particular statue of peace, uh, I think is also about but for me, it is more, um, you know, the, the, the material engagement of the visitor, like with the empty chair, for instance, that, you know, that you have to sit down, uh, for instance. Um, also, the, the placing of, that, you know, where do you look at uh, then when, uh, once you uh, have sat down, sat down. So I think, yeah, your comment, um, yeah, I, I, I fully agree that, you know, the, the material reality, you know, the placement, When you, when you want to think about uh, monuments uh, and statues maybe in particular as well. Um, I'm trying to address your question about, um, that I should say more about you know, why the use of popular culture. I understand it as, like, what, what does the visual add here? Um, I mean, we also added, asked this question here. And um, I think, you know, because you were asking whether I can, can I say, you know, the, the, three aspects that highlighted in, in my film reading, can I say this also without having seen the film? I would say no. <laughs> 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 because, uh, so this is why I think, um, yeah, uh, it is important um, to, or to, to watch the film. 
I mean, I'm, I'm looking more at the film, you know, how does it reimagine um, the, the uprising in Guangzhou, or how does it articulate this notion of the new career, the, the democratic transition of, from the old to the new, the democratic career. And, um, yeah, I, I think I forgot what I wanted to say, but... Um, <laughs> That's a good point, maybe where Kyung Hee and, and Danielle could come in, maybe to say a few more words about that transition from, from authoritarianism to democracy and the legacy of the protest, post Guangzhou and the, the 1987 protest. Maybe if you'd like to, you could say a few words about that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say a few very brief things. So, so my work is, has not been as so much a visuality that I've been brought in because I've looked quite closely at, I guess, ideas and discourse that have um, permeated Queen protest, and um, somebody asked about why the middle class was yourself um, got involved in Guangzhou. Yeah, yeah. I um, so I think that's a really interesting question. That's what I'm interested in. So, what does it take for people to break free of their, you know, difficult everyday lives where they're trying to get by, not really interested in politics, feed their children, look after their elderly parents, and go out on the streets and risk their lives and bring about political change? And it's happened three times, in, at least, in modern Korean history, right? 1980, 1987, and 2016. And I think it's really interesting. And so some of the things I've looked at is the way in which, I mean, around 1980, you know, there's a very brief um, historical lesson that the, in Korea, the hegemonic discourse was anti-communism, it was very strong, um, and um, student activism was quite radical, quite pro-North Korean, or perceived as quite, quite pro-North Korean. And taxi driver, you see the taxi driver asking the students initially, why don't you just study? And so there was this idea that, that students were just troublemakers and if you just work hard and try and get along in Korean society or in any society, the way the state works, that you'll be rewarded for your hard efforts. And that ultimately things are fair, that the system is fair and working for us, the people. But what the brutal, brutal oppression, suppression of the, of the student demonstrations showed in Gwangju to the people who were there were quite obvious that this wasn't happening. And there's all these, an anthropologist based there at the time talks about how parents would lock their students in the house and go out on the streets themselves. So it's kind of this shift in their mind, in people's minds, this realisation that, that state society relations are not what they seem to be. Same in 87, um, I would argue, happened when uh, constitutional reform was postponed and what sparked it. And again in 2016, when all this corruption in the head of government. And I could go on and on, but I won't. I'll, I'll pass over to Kyung. But I think that the, the reasons why the middle class gets involved in any society in this peaceful or not peaceful protests are really fascinating, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk something about the relationship between 1980 protest and 1987 protest. I would say the 1980 Guangzhou was really like a, it was by themselves, uh, you know, like the Guangzhou people versus police or, or militaries, you know, and the outsiders of Guangzhou. Even although we are Koreans, like an educated point, we didn't know what was actually happening, and the media was telling us all fake news. But then. The Peter Hand, he filmed all this, um, and then it was shown overseas, and that film was also remade, refilmed by Korean students mostly, and they were all shown in university uh, campus. And then I guess the ones in 1987, the ones you know in Yonsei, like the one, the photos we took, those students mostly they watched the Peter Hand's film uh, in their private like a student room and then they realized that what happened in Guangzhou and they felt so that you know, like a, oh we owe something to them and so to me from authoritarian regime to democracy it didn't take a, like a, within a second it took a, for us like a, over 30 40 years <laughs> and the Guangzhou uprising was really I think it was critically uh, critical because it, it was a, it occurred right after we finished our martial mm. like a Park Jung Hee Yushin mm. regime over 20 years. So people were expecting to have a like a sour spring, spring in Seoul, but that didn't happen. But Korean people were isolated and they went through all the miserable thing. And then the rest of the Korea they had to endure this over six, seven years. So 87 was uh, the event was occurred at the end of the the dictator Jeon Do after Park Jung Hee. So to me, these two events are really connected, and it was a really important, a critical moment for Korea, uh, Korea's democracy. Basically. So, so we have three minutes and forty-three seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone who hasn't had the chance to, to say something who would like to speak? Uh, oh. Boris, yeah. 
I'd just like to say something about the statue in the, on the bus that um, Dave showed us. It reminded me of the African American woman. Is it Rosa yeah. Parks who was on the bus? Um, so maybe it speaks to the idea about occupying space um, and, and how you, the role of these statues. Uh, again, as Shai said, not quite sure what it means, but mm. when I saw that figure on the bus, I couldn't help but think of her. That can't be an accident. And how, um, you know, it's how subversive it was, because it was in the faces of the white people and was mm. seen as an affront, mm -hmm. um, despite virtue of being there. Mm. Um, and, and perhaps there's a parallel with um, the old colonial gov old, old government general building in Seoul mm. that was torn down. That was an affront because it occupied that central space that was so important. Of course, there, there was the building too, but it's a space that it took up. Sure. Um, there are a lot of debates around the US Army bases location right in central Seoul as well, which was moved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, if I could add what I was referring yes. to, that was, that was um, also very planned. We get the sense in history that she just one day sat down on the bus and was like, this is it. But actually, it was part of a very focused attempt to have that image and Rosa Parks herself volunteering mm -hmm. for it. So in fact, it wasn't. There's something about this, too, that uprising, kind of this idea of being motivated by some spark or trigger, that was a question. Or there's also manipulation on the side of the protesters, too, which is maybe interesting about the film in that case. Maybe it shows there's also an agency in the protesting and the other side of it mm -hmm. that we don't see as just kind of this naturally happens and actually has to be planned. Like That's the international Gramscian argument that in yeah. Germany, before anything can change, yeah. but there has to be a shift in yeah. how people think. If something will trigger it, but if that shift isn't there, then nothing is going to happen. Yeah. So we need, uh, but look, we, we, we're going to go, and some of us at least have a drink, if, if people can face the, the elements and get the cold out there. I think we might head down to the Lucy if you'd like to join us. But in the meantime, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for everyone. So. Thank you all. Just a round of applause to Roland. Yeah.